Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining us for our first in a series of amazing programming that we have for you all in store for 2023. And on behalf of the Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative of Cleveland, we just want to tell you a little bit about us if you are new to the crew. And we are a collaborative among Case Western Reserve University and its affiliated hospital systems, the Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health, University Hospitals, and the Lewis Stokes Veterans Administration Medical Center. And we aspire to be a catalyst for high quality clinical and translational research, both locally and nationally, by changing the culture and environment of biomedical research, sharing resources and expertise, and streamlining the research process to move translational research from bench to bedside and to the community. We will start today's presentation with Dr. Clara Pelfrey. She is an associate professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, serving as director of program evaluation for the Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative in Cleveland, Ohio. She holds a PhD in medical microbiology and immunology from The Ohio State University. Her experience includes 19 years in translational research studying the immunology of multiple sclerosis. Dr. Pelfrey has served as a PI on her own R01 grant and as a reviewer on NIH study sections. She is co-inventor on a patent and has been involved in clinical trials on MS. This has provided her with a thorough understanding of clinical and translational research. She served as a scientific review officer for the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program and the Institute for Educational Sciences, where she ran peer review panels for biomedical and educational research and prepared scientific summary statements to communicate with principal investigators. Dr. Pelfrey's other experience includes serving as program officer for a Cleveland Clinic pilot grant program and teaching in the graduate and medical schools at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Pelfrey served as the chair of the Translational Research Evaluation Topical Interest Group within the American Evaluation Association in 2016 through 2017, and again in 2019 through 2020. Since 2016, she has been an active member of and currently leads the Retrospective Translational Science Case Study Workgroup. This group has published a detailed protocol for conducting successful translational science case studies, and in 2021, published the first translational science case study in the JCTS. Dr. Pelfrey, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joyce. Let me just project. There, can everybody see my slide? Yes. Okay, great. Um, welcome everyone. And today I wanted to talk to you about Pilots and Beyond, the CTSC research impact on legislative, regulatory, or practice policy. So today I'm gonna to talk about the evaluation research that helped us uncover that impact, uh, the CTSC and its supported research that led to health impact and to policy changes. And then I'm gonna talk about translating for impact and how to involve researchers in that process. So in evaluation research, we gather evidence of how research leads to outcomes such as improved health or improved health care, and also informing public health policy or new clinical guidelines. And one way that we gather that evidence is conducting translational science case studies. The other way is that we gather information on how the CTSC has supported successful research uh, and we gather information from sources that show how the publications have informed various policies. So first I'd like to talk about the translational science case study. Uh, this is a collaborative with eight other CTS, CTSA hubs across the US. And we've accomplished several milestones since this group got together. First, uh, there was no method for doing a translational science case study. So we published a rigorous protocol for this uh, in the Journal of Clinical and Translational Science in 2020. And then just this year, uh, we were approached by uh, a research organization that makes audio pods or basically podcasts on various forms of research. And that has been published 
It's called Charting How Research Leads from Discoveries to Improved Health. We also successfully lobbied the Journal of Clinical and Translational Science to create a new manuscript category specifically for these translational science case studies. And they felt it was important enough that they made it free to publish with gold open access. We created a classification system for the translational science case studies. And that was so that we could do cross case analysis. And by cross case analysis, I mean sort of a meta analysis comparing cases to each other and looking for common themes, such as the things that helped facilitate the research and the barriers and challenges that they had to overcome. And finally, we created a retrospective translational science case study research work group of CTSA evaluators, and we're examining these facilitators and challenges in a cross case analysis using multiple different case studies. And we're doing this in order to learn more about the translational process. So, next, I'm going to show you some examples of CTSC supported research that involved health equity, accessibility, or they affect vulnerable populations and have had significant impact in human health or clinical practice or even in policy. So in order to look from research all the way to policy, we asked how can CTSC supported research improve human health and inform the policy? And one way to do that is to look at published research findings. And you can look at those in academic citations, in news media, patent references, but we've chosen to look at policy documents and we used the website Overton in order to do that. So this is an image from um, the analyst journal in 2020. And it shows basically the, the very first uh, translational science case study that we've written in the lower right there in JCTS. And it involves Dr. Umit Gherkin. Um, and he has developed a paper-based microchip electrophoresis system for point-of-care hemoglobin testing. And we went on with our case study to do a timeline of his research shown here. And you can see uh, at the very left, upper left-hand corner, the, it starts in about 2014, where the inception of the idea and developing the, the device and eventually clinical studies were done in Africa and Thailand and in India, and all the way until you get to the very lower right of it. And you can see in June of 2021, seven years after he started this research, the newborn screening uh, received regulatory approval by the FDA. So we've made a big banner in the lower right here. Investing in innovation for underserved populations really does save lives. And this is being used in multiple underserved countries, Africa, India, among others, um, to screen newborns for um, sickle cell. So another CTSC supported research was the SPRINT trial. And for those of you who are not familiar with the SPRINT trial, this was a very large study looking at comparing the existing guidelines for hypertension, which were anything um, above 140 millimeters of mercury in uh, basically systolic blood pressure and comparing that to keeping the blood pressure below 120 in systolic. And the uh, PIs of this were from university hospitals, uh, Dr. Wright and Dr. Rahman, um, and it was a very important study. So, what we're showing here is that the randomized trial was initially published in the New England Journal in 2015. And the CTSC role was that the clinical research units were involved in this study. And that original paper has now been cited in over 60 policy documents, including 42 different clinical guidelines, among others. In 2019, the clinical guidelines uh, were revised for the American Heart Association uh, with these new, new measures, new guidelines. And the human health impact here at the right, you can see keeping the blood pressure at or below 120 systolic showed a 25% decrease in cardiovascular events 
and even more importantly, a 27% decrease in the risk of death. But another really important part of this trial was that it looked at racial and ethnic health disparities. Many trials are not successful in recruiting enough minorities uh, to have the studies of the trial be true for those individuals. And here, Blacks and Hispanics have higher rates of uncontrolled blood pressure, and Blacks have greater risk of hypertension-related cardiovascular disease. But the SPRINT trial managed to enroll 30% Black and 11% Hispanic participants. So therefore, the, the data, the results were statistically true for those minority populations also. So that made it a particularly important trial. Another important study supported by the CTSC was a study of mild gestational diabetes. And this was published in the New England Journal in 2008. Uh, it has, uh, was supported by the CTSC through the clinical research units at Metro Health Hospital. And it's been cited in 33 policy documents and uh, altered 23 different clinical guidelines. Even the World Health Organization came out with new guidelines in 2013, as well as 24 different clinical guideline documents in PubMed Central. And the human health impact is very clearly that the new guidelines have recommended glucose cutoff values for gestational diabetes mellitus are lower than those recommended by earlier guidelines. So we're uh, definitely affecting vulnerable population here of pregnant women in a positive way. The next study supported by the CTSC was how neighborhoods influence child maltreatment. And interestingly, this wasn't a trial so much as a literature review, and it was published in Child Abuse and Neglect in 2007. This was the study of one of our KL2 scholars supported by the CTSC. It's been cited in 17 policy documents, and uh, the gu new guidelines came out in 2011 were the economic determinants and consequences of child maltreatment by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And OECD document showed or said that there was a very strong link between low economic resources and higher risk of child abuse and neglect. But importantly, they also said, they concluded that the evidence base for effective prevention programs is still very weak and additional rigorous research is needed. So another vulnerable population here, children that was affected. So how do we improve evaluating and communicating the health and societal benefits of clinical and translational sciences? Well, one way is to start the research planning with the impact in mind, the ultimate impact in mind. And, and so um, this new model was uh, created in 2018 by the people at Washington University and it's called the Translational Science Benefits Model. This is a new framework for assessing the health and societal benefits of clinical and translational sciences. But what's new, brand new, is uh, that they created a, a toolkit. And so I'll talk to you th here through the conceptual model uh, that they have this on the left, the resources are what go into your research, the people and the grant money and the laboratory, everything that goes on is, is the resources. Then you do your research activities. And typically the scientific outputs, uh, the outcomes are often publications and grants. That's what's typically been used for evaluation results. But this model says, it needs to go further. It needs to go past dissemination and implementation into real benefits for society. And these benefits include these four categories, which I will show you in a little more detail here. Um, clinical benefits include new procedures, clinical guidelines, tools, devices, and products. In the community, the benefits include health activities, care programs, and health promotion. Uh, economic benefits include new commercial products, financial savings and benefits, as well as policy and legislative benefits include advisory activities, policy, legislation, new guidelines, that sort of thing. So the WashU people have recently published this on their website. It's called a toolkit helper. 
for translating impact. And it's really intended for researchers. And it helps talk them step by step through thinking through uh, the what sort of impact their research is going to have ultimately. Um, and in a little bit more detail, uh, first I wanted to say how the, how the toolkit is supposed to be helpful. It helps clinical and public health researchers at any career stage. It can integrate impact throughout the research process by using this model. And it helps researchers both plan, track, and demonstrate the impact of maybe their single project of research, perhaps an entire complete body of their work, or the work of whole programs and centers. So how does it work? This toolkit, Translating for Impact, has three parts. It has a plan, it has a, a tracking, and it has demonstration tools, nine tools altogether. So in the planning phases, you have the roadmap to in, uh, impact, sort of mapping out how you're going to get to that impact, the benefits you expect to have, who your partners are and who's going to manage your team. In the tracking part, you literally track the impact that you're having, you benchmark progress on various metrics. And in the demonstration phase, you, you have a product navigator to choose the impact product for your audience, case study builder. Again, we're talking about case studies, another type of them here, um, impact profiles and dissemination planners. And uh, I intend to show you just two of these, the roadmap to impact, which is at the very start of all of this, and the impact profile that will result at the very end. So this is an example of the roadmap to impact. This is, again, in intended for investigators to map out each of these um, challenge, the value, the partners, where equity comes into this and inclusion how they're going to disseminate it, what are their impact metrics, who's on their team, and the potential benefits they expect to get. And it's been shown that if investigators are thinking about this at the start of the research, they're more likely to actually get to those impactful uh, benefits at the end. And here is an example of the ultimate impact profile. This one is a research study. It's a single page, one pager, um, of the impact profile of the study where they were reducing teen pregnancy with contraceptive choice project. And it has a section here for the research highlights, which resulted in dramatically lower teen pregnancy rates compared to the national average, and also dramatically lower abortion rates compared to national average, as well as over 5 million in Medicaid cost savings. And you can see lower on this is another portion called the key benefits, and this details those societal benefits that are in the model. The clinical benefits, new guidelines, they established a new community health center, they resulted in significantly lower teen pregnancy and abortion rates, and provided supporting evidence for the Supreme Court Hobby Lobby case, and saved an estimated $5 million in Medicaid costs. So in summary, the CTSA program's goal is to accelerate the translation of research findings into improved public health and evaluation research using translational science case studies to uncover that impact is one way that we show that. And also you can teach, we can teach investigators how to use the Translating for Impact Toolkit so they can approach their research with the ultimate impact in mind. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Palfrey. That was wonderful. And now, Dr. Tolley, let's learn a little bit about you before you begin your presentation. Dr. Valerie Tolley is an associate professor and holds the Carl W. and Margaret Davis Walter Professor of Pediatric Nursing at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. She has led pioneering research through a sequential series of studies illuminating the experiences of families caring for children dependent on life-saving technology. For example, mechanical ventilation, feeding tubes, at home. Her studies have been funded by the Society of Pediatric Nurses, Sigma Theta Tau International, and the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Nursing Research. Dr. Tolley's major research contributions include 
leading descriptive investigations into the impact of caregiving on parents' mental health, normalization efforts, family functioning, conducting randomized controlled trials of resourcefulness and mindfulness interventions on parents' physical and mental health, stress self-management, for example, sleep, and highlighting mothers' experiences throughout the transition trajectory prior to and following their infant's discharge from the neonatal intensive care unit. Her research has been featured in national and international scoping and integrative reviews, theoretical and empirical work, and professional books by nurses, physicians, and other healthcare professionals around the globe, and integrated into practice and policy guidelines of national and international pediatric medicine and nursing associations. Dr. Tolley is currently the PI of a large RL1 study entitled Resourcefulness Intervention to Promote Self-Management in Parents of Technology-Dependent Children, funded by the NIH National Institute of Nursing Research. Dr. Tolley, you may begin. Okay. Thank you so much for that introduction and for this opportunity to share a little bit of my experience. I uh, really appreciated hearing from Dr. Pelfrey um, some of those actual toolkits. I did not have that in hand um, when I was developing this presentation, um, and I look forward to using that in the future, especially to look at the impact profile uh, from the outset of research. But um, you could go to the next slide. So I wanted to discuss a little bit about my research journey. Uh, my program of research, as you heard in the introduction, is with families caring for children dependent on life-saving medical technology, like uh, mechanical ventilators, feeding tubes, tracheostomies at home. Um, this came out of my clinical practice and this is how I got very interested in this population of parents and uh, their children. Um, I can let you know on my research journey, I am very grateful for the support and assistance of the CTSC that supported the majority of my studies. They gave me space for interviewing my participants. They also helped with providing some of the lab services. They also helped with uh, lab coordinate or research coordination and also consultation when I needed it. Next slide, please. So some of the past research studies that I've done, so um, I started out with my dissertation. It was a descriptive correlational study, uh, normalization and family functioning in families with a child who is dependent on medical technology. So that was the first one. Um, and it's really serendipitous that I uh, happened to find somebody that was in the Bowell Health Center for the neonatal follow-up um, study that actually told me a little bit about the, the uh, resources at the CTSC. So that was my dissertation. That led to a 12-month follow-up of these very same participants. So it was 12 months later. Um, and uh, the next study that I ended up doing was um, I found with this descriptive correlational studies and the follow-up that the only predictor of family functioning in these studies was mother's level of depressive symptoms. And I interviewed each of these parents as I was doing these studies. And what I was really finding is there was a lot of psychological distress. Um, so I, it wasn't enough to just do descriptive studies. So I really wanted to look at what can we do for these families. Um, it's then that I started hearing about what my colleague uh, had been researching, and that was an intervention called resourcefulness training. So I decided that this, because it was such a high level of psychological distress, it was best if I could uh, try to use some something like this intervention with my uh, parents. However, I wanted to do a small pilot study to look at the feasibility and acceptability of the intervention. Um, so I started this small pilot study. Next slide, please. Um, so I found with that study that it was, I saw um, an, a clinical difference in the mental health 
condition of these parents. They did much, much better um, when those that were in the intervention group as compared to the control group. Um, so I really looked into doing further studies with a much larger sample. So the pilot study only had uh, 20 parents. Um, and I, I was developing uh, the NIH funded applications. Um, I also started another study that looked at transitions for these mothers that were caring for these technology dependent neonates. So I looked for a population of children where parents would have to uh, take them from the hospital to home. So I found that the largest population was in the, the neonatal intensive care units. So that's where recruited parents for this particular study. I was really looking at the transition from the hospital to home. So I looked at what was it like for these mothers um, about two weeks before their infant was discharged from the hospital, and then one month following discharge and then three months following discharge. And this was a mixed method study uh, that told, gave me a lot of information. I looked at things uh, like, again, their mental health status. I looked at PTSD regarding this experience since they many of them um, almost lost their infants many different times during that hospitalization. And I looked at messages they had regarding transition discharge teaching, and then what were their considerations after they got home from the hospital? What do they wish that healthcare providers would know? The next study I ended up um, getting funded on was, again, this was a pilot study. It was a randomized controlled trial. And it looked at, again, resourcefulness training intervention, but it also looked at a mindfulness type of intervention too and looking at how that was um, beneficial for parents. So again, I saw that that was, there was a significant difference in those that were in the intervention group for their physical health and their mental health. The next study uh, that I had funded was for an R15, and that was, again, resourcefulness intervention. This was a larger population than the pilot studies which only the previous pilot study had 30 participants max. Um, this one ended up having 93 participants. And again, what we found was, especially for physical health and mental health, uh, there was a significant difference for those that were in the intervention group. And I currently have a study, it's also a resourcefulness intervention study, but what I'm looking at is not only physical health and mental health, but I'm looking at what I call self-management or it's their um, sleep and health promotion types of activities. Next slide, please. So when I thought about um, this opportunity to share with you, how did, they, how did I find out about translation of my research into evidence? And I really, uh, when I had the opportunity, was asked about any kind of policy types of changes or legislation. And I really had to think about that because what I had found in the past when I had done some analysis of where my research is being used, what I found is that it's generally used in practice guidelines. Now, I did not do an exhaustive search like Dr. Palfrey and do case studies, but I did look at examples that I could share from, from my research with you. So what are some potential options as far as translating research into evidence to inform practice? First of all, it's professional organizational uh, practice guidelines. And these professional guidelines can influence practice and care of individuals. So some changes may not require state or national legislation. And then the section, second option that I found as I was searching through the literature is the integration of research and theory development. So that was the other thing that was a little bit surprising uh, to me is that uh, the, re the results from my research was used in model development to assist with reconceptualization of practice in some way. 
Next slide, please. So some examples that I wanted to share with you of the influence of my research and some practice guidelines were from the American Academy of Pediatric in the Council of Children with Disabilities. They came out with a clinical report for non-oral feeding for children and youth with developmental or acquired disabilities. And this is really guidance for clinicians rendering pediatric care. Um, so as you'll see, some of the guidelines um, are from associations in the United States and others are gonna be international. This one happened to be from the United States. The second one is planning consideration for persons with access and functional needs in a disaster. And this was an informational paper for disaster planning. And this was for the Office of the Assistant Secretary for preparedness and response. And this was in 2018 for the United States. Next slide, please. So again, this was from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So what I did is I looked, if I was cited by them, what exactly in my research were they looking at? So with this particular guideline, what they were looking at is um, they were saying communication with families regarding the process, the effect on siblings, timing and scheduling of feedings, uh, description of the feeding schedule um, and the most difficult aspects of non-oral feeding and the level of perceived well-being of the primary caregivers. That was what they were focusing on. And so they had taken information from my research then to develop part of these guidelines. So that's one example of research influence on guidelines. Next slide. The next one was from the Office of the United States Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. And what they were looking at is they were saying parents of technology dependent children report higher levels of psychological stress related to their care demands. And so based on that, they knew the result would be in potentially impaired family functioning, especially if they were displaced or if there was some sort of service disruption in a disaster. So that's how my research was used in that particular guideline. Next slide, please. And there's further guidelines that I wanted to highlight as examples. And this was from the National Perinatal Association NICU Discharge Preparation Transition Planning. And that was most recent. And that was um, from 2022. And then there was a pediatric home mechanical ventilation. That was from the Canadian Thoracic Society Clinical Practice Guideline. Um, and that was from 2017. Next was a guideline for non-invasive and invasive mechanical ventilation for treatment of chronic respiratory failure. That was in 2017. And that was from Germany. Next slide, please. So first of all, this came out from the National Perinatal Association for their NICU discharge preparation and transition planning. And it was an interdisciplinary guideline. And they were really looking at a model of multidisciplinary family-centered care to optimize outcomes. And they were saying the need for not only the healthcare providers, but also parents. And so they really focused on some of the um, work I had done. And there's a publication that I have about mother's voices. And so this was pre-discharge and post-discharge. They were talking about what were their needs and what did they really desire. And they really had some, um, some strong messages for healthcare providers about what we can do to help them in that um, discharge education and how they wanted to be an integral part from the very beginning. Um, next slide, please. The next one was from the Canadian Thoracic Society, the clinical practice guideline. And they looked at a couple different factors from my research. One was related to family functioning and related outcomes. Um, they wanted the message to get out that there's a greater number of depressive symptoms and that was correlated with poorer family functioning. And that came directly from my research findings. Um, 
And second of all, they wanted to look at the health and related outcomes. And they highlighted uh, the intervention that I had conducted with resourcefulness training and the impact that it had on parent caregiver mental health. Next slide, please. The next guideline was the German Respiratory Society Guidelines, part one and part two. And they uh, discussed in here that it's very important uh, to assess the needs of the patient and family. And so they got into what are some of the family factors that individuals that are gonna be um, taking care of these children at home, what do healthcare providers need to be concerned about? Next slide. So not only can research be translated into um, clinical guidelines and into practice, but also in theory development. And again, like I said, this was a little surprising, but I'm very glad to hear that. Um, I do teach a course here at the School of Nursing related to theory. And I often teach my students about how you have a theory at the outset of your research to kind of frame the research. Um, and it's really testing a portion of the theory and do the research then, but it should fold back into uh, theory development. So here we are, uh, reconceptualizing children's complex discharge with health systems theory. And this was from a group in Ireland in 2014. And then there was a shared decision-making model regarding assistive technology for the child with severe neurological impairment that was in 2014 from Canada. Next slide, please. So the health systems theory development by nurses in Ireland uh, really used my research from uh, 2012. So this was my dissertation research was used to support identifying barriers to effective discharge and development of the theoretical framework that emphasizes effective discharging, discharge planning procedures, individually tailoring uh, family support and education, and the recognition of the potential emotional, social impact on the child, on the siblings, and on the parents. So this is their theory. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, previous slide. Okay, and um, this next theory has to do with the Pediatric Outcomes Research Team and the Can Child Center for Disability Research. And they looked at, um, in this theory, the introduction of medical technology for children that had a severe neurological impairment and how it impacts family, it influences their daily routines, the frequency and intensity of their interactions with the healthcare system. So they developed this shared decision-making model for discussions with these families when um, they're gonna be introducing the use of technology or the uh, life-saving medical technology with a child. So final slide. So in conclusion, publishing and disseminating findings from research studies provides evidence for incorporating um, evidence into practice guidelines and future theory development. Plus it provides a catalyst for future regulatory policies. So the partnership between research scientists, clinicians, professional organizations, regulatory bodies, and policy makers is imperative to improve healthcare delivery and the health outcomes for individuals, families, communities, nations, and the world. So thank you so much for your attention. And thank you very much, Dr. Tully, Dr. Pelfrey. Thank you both for putting together those presentations that really show us globally and locally how much of an impact we can make as a research community, as researchers and those that support uh, especially health equity research, health disparities research, what we can do to impact policies. So do we have any questions from the chat? Oh, and Dr. Pelfrey put a link to Overton in the chat. Dr. Pelfrey, if you wouldn't mind reminding us what Overton is and how it can be used. Overton really is a, it's a small startup, believe it or not, but it's uh, it's based over in the UK. and. Um, 
essentially it's a site for connecting people, researchers or organizations in finding how they have informed policy. And you use it by getting either the, um, the DOIs from the publications and put them into a, an Excel sheet. And then you basically paste them into Overton and it will look up all of those papers and find every uh, policy citation, you know, every policy document that has cited that, that um, you know, that paper. Um, and then you can drill down in about a hundred different ways <laughs> to find, um, you know, who, which, which organizations are you are citing it and how are they citing it? And you know, they'll actually give you the policy documents so you can look up how they're, you know, how they're using it and everything. So it's it's very powerful. In some cases, it's almost too powerful because it's kind of overwhelming <laughs> when you go use it to use it. But um, but it allowed allowed me to to do those little timelines sort of thing of, you know it was cited by which and, and what has it led to and that sort of thing. Okay, excellent, thank you. Dr. Tully, if you could tell us a little bit about your state of mind before you were even cited in any of the policy documents, were you thinking about policy and the impact that your research could have on you know, the lives of children across the world and parents? I think I could say that it was actually my dream to look at how my research could impact practice. Um, like I said, I was um, a pediatric home health care nurse uh, for several years before I went back to get my PhD. So that was uh, a dream and a wish of mine. But um, it would be nice to say that I had, you know, this timeline and all the, you know, the toolkit that Dr. Palfrey talked about, but I, I actually did not. Um, so I was, um, I was delighted to see when I was doing a search a few weeks ago, how it had been picked up in some policy guidelines, not only here in the United States, but also internationally as well. Thank you. And we have a question from Sherry Bolin, if you'd like to take yourself off mute. Yeah, um, I had a question for Clara. Thank you. This is both of you. Great talks. Um, this is more of a practical question. For the translational science benefits model, um, I've played a, a little bit on their website, and I love how you can sort of type things in and then it'll show up in the document. Um, but have you have you tried to use that at all? And do you know if you can, it, it sort of goes to their website. Are you able to like download it and use it on your own website um, as opposed to just theirs? And if you have an empty bucket because there's an area you haven't done anything with, like say economic benefit, um, does it leave a blank there or will it just not have it there because it looks weird if it's sitting there with a blank? So it's more of a practical question how you know. That's a great question. Um, the translational science benefits models website has a lot more than just the tool. I just showed you the tool today, but uh, initially they just came out with the paper describing the model. And it was a it was a great guide for evaluators because NCATS has always said, what impact, what impact? And we're all kind of saying, what do you mean by impact? They spelled it out for us. This is what we mean by impact. So now we knew what we were looking for exactly. Um, the toolkit is brand new and it actually is intended for, it, it was intended for investigators. Um, you can download it uh, in any form you want, like PDF, Word, you name it. Uh, there is a section there for downloading it um, and and then use it, you know, on your own computer. Nobody's going to see you, what you typed or what you didn't type. Um, the third thing they have on their website are case studies. Now, they're not full translational science case studies in this in the way that we put in our protocol. Our protocol is quite rigorous and, and we've turned up, we, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot by making it so rigorous that um, it's it's quite challenging to do one our way basically. So they have provided an easier way, which is uh, kind of a, a, a simpler form of a case study. And they're actually asking people to submit them and they will post them on their website, but you can do them yourself. But the toolkit is all, all of it is downloadable. Oh, great. Your private use. Thank yeah. you. And it is certainly not expected that any, any research would have 
benefits in all four categories. Like that's, of course, that's exceptional. That's why they're, it's on their website as an example. <laughs> Most people don't don't have that much impact, but yeah. And adding to that question, Dr. Palfrey, what are some resources the CTSC provides that you think could be supportive or helpful to a researcher who wants to be that exceptional researcher and have benefits in most, if not all of those categories? How would you approach that? I'm thinking spark, but uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what do you think? <laughs> no, that's a wonderful question. Um, spark, for those of you who aren't familiar, spark request is actually our request system for the CTSC. And although we haven't formalized it on in Spark, um, we are going to be making evaluation consults available in Spark. Um, so people could sit down with me to, to talk through how they might do that, how they would um, you know, approach learning about the impact of their research or maybe planning it using the tool, for example, um, that sort of thing. So does that answer your question or did I, did I miss it? <laughs> No, you absolutely did. Do you think there are any other services that could complement that that the CTSC provides? Oh, well, right. there's lots. I mean, the CTSC <laughs> has um, has pilot awards, and um, we are going to be soon when we get refunded. Say when uh, we get refunded, we're going to have a voucher system. So that will even expand the number of things that investigators can use in the CTSC and be funded for through the CTSC. Uh, and they will include, uh, they have to be multi-center trials or multi-site studies, um, but then they can get vouchers. Um, you also can get statistical help, uh, research design help, regulatory help, all of these things. If you're unfamiliar with what the CTSC offers, um, Yes, wonderful. Um, Delise posted it. Spark.case.edu. Go there. Our like, you know, portfolio of everything that we offer, our catalog, if you want, is on that, and it is at multiple sites too. So if you're at Metro or you're at the Cleveland Clinic or wherever, uh, there are multiple services, and we have the ready consultations, of course, which Delise can tell you about. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's research, equity, accessibility, diversity, and inclusion. And I had my first consult with Dr. Tolley last year, and it was absolutely just, it, it was a ton of fun going through the strategic plan for the National um, Institute for Nursing Research and figuring out the puzzle because every research program and research study is like a puzzle, but it's fun to put together bring all these resources to the table, know that we're here to support you. And I'd like to put up a slide and maybe this will trigger some questions from our attendees. So why does research matter for policy? And we've heard a lot from our presenters already, but when we think about how it can help identify critical problems, Expose benefits and harms of policy solutions, potential and those that already are in existence. It helps estimate costs and consequences of policy proposals and aids in real-time decision-making. What are people thinking when we see this, whether it pertains to your existing research program, a research study that you're thinking about doing? What are some thoughts? And feel free to take yourself off mute if it's easier to say it. And if I may share an anecdote while people are thinking, when I think about identification of critical problems and bills that have been introduced into legislation about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in research and some that have been included in recent funding in the omnibus, it's really exciting to see how research does impact policy and direct where we're going with things. And it's really just exciting to see that we do have some control, some influence over the direction of the biomedical research enterprise. And Dr. Pelfrey? Yeah, I'm glad you showed this slide. It made me think of something when I read that exposes benefits and harms of policy solution and estimating costs and consequences. A very interesting consequence that happened with relating to that um, 
testing uh, babies for sickle cell anemia. We learned from Umit Gherkin a very interesting story where uh, they they had the, the device manufactured outside the U.S. So it technically isn't a an American you know device. Uh, and then they wanted to get it into uh, uh, African countries where sickle cell is endemic, and often babies don't get tested and die before you know before they reach uh, even teenagerhood. So. Um, but one really big problem that they encountered was all the tariffs that were slapped on this device coming into the country suddenly made it not affordable for the very people who needed to be able to afford it. You know, like it was designed in mind and manufactured outside the US with the thought that it would be inexpensive for low resource countries. And then those very same countries slapped all these tariffs on it because it was American supposedly um and and then suddenly it wasn't that affordable anymore and so this is a huge problem that you know the investigator who invents this device has absolutely no control over it um and it, it would require additional government workarounds you know to lower those tariffs so it's an interesting side story absolutely thank you for sharing that I'm curious about research related to policy about for-profit healthcare. Your thoughts? This is a question from Christina Wong in the chat. I guess I would love clarifying that somewhat. Like Does anyone intend policy to go into the for profit arena only, or, or it just happens to end up there? Um, care delivery. Okay. Um, that is a good question. Yeah, I think that one's more for Valerie. The mental health part. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the whole question because it's coming in from pieces. Curious about research related to policy for um, mental health. I think it's a great question because, as we know, in the United States, it is mental health care, particularly after the pandemic, is high on the priority and it is a big thing like right that. Um, so it's looking at potentially, I guess the way I'm taking this question is what are some uh, interventions that can be done for this? Um, I don't know about policies, about making parity, uh, greater parity in insurance companies for covering mental health care because I know that still seems to be an issue. Um, it is a great need, I, I totally agree. And it's something that can be incorporated in primary care, mental health. And I know uh, for pediatric nurse practitioners, and I am a nurse, pediatric nurse practitioners and taught in the, uh, the program here at the School of Nursing for several years, um, it's been a focus of our national organization looking at uh, some strategies and interventions, what can be introduced in the primary care setting, uh, what are some assessment tools that we can do. Um, and it would be interesting to see the translation into policy for some of these interventions that have been developed, but I don't have the answers to that right now. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Dr. Pelfrey and Dr. Tolley, and I would like to share what's next. So we have another edition, Health Policy 101. It'll be held on May 9th, 2023, from 12 to 1 through Zoom. We'll have Amy McGee. She's the Executive Director of the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, and she may have some additional thoughts on that question, Christina, so we hope to see you at that webinar as well. 
And what can I do today? This is a question that a lot of people ask when they attend all these webinars. Schedule a ready consultation at spark.case.edu. And Dr. Pelfrey told you about all of the other services that the CTSC offers as well. And you can sign up to attend future programming and join our listserv so that you don't miss out on any future programming, news, et cetera. And then there are some CTSC DEIA resources on our website, as well as the host of other CTSC resources that you can explore. And that is something that you can literally do after this webinar is over. And thank you for joining us. Please follow us at CTSC underscore Cleveland on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn. You can email us and you will receive a response. So we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. And it is almost 1 p.m. So thank you so much again for your time. And we hope that you benefited from attending this program. Thanks, Jaleese. Thank you. Thank you, Jaleese.